The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. Here's Brandon. Welcome back to our fourth day, our fourth episode this week. This is the Brandon Peters Show. Today's episode will feature a discussion on William Friedkin's 1977 film Sorcerer. And to join me for that chat from Reverend Entertainment, a writer, producer, just filmmaker, and all around good guy, Justin B. Hey, man. Thanks for having me back on. It's been too long. I know it has, but we keep in touch throughout the year. But I was like, yeah. oh, need to have you on. Okay, yeah. And this months later, I was like, oh, yeah, I need. I'm like, it's crazy. It was a blast last time, man. I really appreciate it. And, and it's been so exciting to see your momentum that you've had with this. It just keeps growing and growing and going and going. So you're really, you're hustling. I, I'm, I'm and impressed. I'm still alive. And I'm yeah. still, I, I make short films like once a week. I don't know how. And multiple episodes of the podcast. Don't know how. Don't yeah, know how. Man. Keep don't it know. up. But I love it. I love it. Uh, Hopefully people get on the train. Um, great guests like you have been 50% of the reason it's so good because yeah, I mean, I'm only half the show when I'm on. So, well, I'm always on. <laughs> it's your baby. It's, it's your baby. my baby. It's my baby. But uh, I love the people I have. The, the Brandon Peters show family has been a wonderful thing to have every one of you. Um, but yeah, you've uh, since then, you, I mean, you keep like huge title after huge title. For those of you just checking out this first time, Justin does bonus features for a lot of your favorite blu-rays out there uh with under the reverend entertainment banner um you've been having like a lot like you, you did he knows you're alone which was like a long time wish list title like you did yeah. some just a lot of stuff on that one um it was a good disc I like thanks that one. man yeah that, that turned out really nice um uh, one of the one of like we talked about shop factory and stuff in the past but like i want to bring up because uh i think it was early on in the the era of it when it first came out with a paramount presents mm -hmm. which you were you were part of like pioneering that right you were in the early days of launching i was in at the beginning Thinking, it's yeah. uh the, todd sokolov the head of marketing it's really his baby and he wanted he came in realizing that there was this untapped treasure in the archives and these mm -hmm. what they referred to as catalog titles generally at the yep. studios and paramount has kind of been famous historically for underserving a lot of movies i think any friday the 13th fan can speak to that star so trek as well <laughs> they, star they, trek is mm. yeah which now they're getting though see like mm -hmm. it's and that star trek release just came out and mm -hmm. so uh todd got in there and he just started right away hey guys this is a cool project that i think we could do something with he put the wheels under it and then they reached out to me and asked me to come on board and that's expanded into doing first run epk and doing straight release like regular catalog releases like bad news bears and mm -hmm. The Last Castle and a few other ones that weren't part of the Presents line, mm -hmm. but Presents is a concept. It's a really a it's a fully realized visual, sensory, and presentation with the film concept to remaster these movies, put them in a nice slipcase, the the cover this O cover with the original poster art when you open it up, beautiful new graphics on the front usually on all of them, and then some putting these special features in there and some of these we've been able to really pack with a lot of good stuff it's been fun yeah i i've really liked watching it grow um and it's some of my favorite releases every month and it's fun to watch those those announcements have become really exciting um like harold and maude as we're recording today just got announced um uh, that i didn't had no idea that was coming i was yeah that was, was hard to bite my tongue on on that one and i have a great story about so for that one i did commentary with Cameron Crowe and Larry Karaszewski and Larry's the writer of People versus Larry Flint and Ed Wood so many amazing films and you know Cameron Crowe and Cameron okay. had written the liner notes to the Criterion release that came out years ago oh okay. so yeah two passionate fans about the film Cameron can speak to the musical aspect of it and the importance of that and they both were just amazing in this commentary. But then also I interviewed Cat Stevens now known as Yusuf Islam mm -hmm. and from Dubai and 
it was a fascinating discussion. And I have this great story behind that one, but it ties to another release that we haven't announced yet. So I can't share it yet, but I can't wait to tell it because it's totally insane. You're going to have to come back for that. Absolutely. When, when it comes so, out, I will let you know this is the one and I okay. have the story because I definitely want to tell it. Cliffhanger. Yeah, um, yeah the, these uh, you've worked with Cameron Crowe that he's been on a lot. You've got, uh, you had uh, Almost Famous recently that got up to 4K. Mm-hmm. Um, the Elizabeth Town and then Vanilla Sky's coming. And then he's right. on this Harold and Mod commentary. So he's yeah been all over the Presents line. Yeah. Um, and so is Larry too, because I had Larry for... Um, I just did ragtime with Larry okay. and the writer of ragtime, Paul Weller, got them together on a common, not a, not a commentary, but it's an on-screen discussion with the two of them. Oh, cool. Just talking to each other because this is a Milos Forman film. Mm-hmm. They were both very close to Milos and had years of working with him in very unique ways. And so it's really a one of a kind discussion mm-hmm. that wouldn't be possible anywhere else right. and with anyone else other than these two guys who have walked in those same shoes in, in a way, two writers you know, talking shop about a very beloved filmmaker and one of his most under celebrated movies in some ways, if you think about ragtime. And then yeah. for that one, we were able to find a, all the cut scenes. We were able to find the Emma Goldman piece that, or sequence that, that um, Milos always mourned being removed mm-hmm. from the film. But once we got into the archives, we started discovering more and more and more. And so now there's like 20 cut scenes that are in this thing and we have a work print cut with a lot of that reinstated into the movie too oh, i need to pick this one i didn't get this one i need to pick that one up it's uh, wild it's so great they I, I have i'm behind on like i don't have uh bugsy malone and i don't have ragtime and nashville i think those are three i don't bugsy just around. came out though so yeah. that one yeah that just came out and that was a fun i did paul williams on that one mm-hmm. oh and he and, and he was it was a beautiful conversation he was like singing and Oh, that's great. Oh, man, it's so good. Uh, it was so special. I have coined and I just reviewed Breakdown, which is like a perfect disc. That Thank thing, you. That Thank is you. that is the ideal for a guy. Like, I don't have as much time as I used to back. I yeah. mean, we all don't. But that yeah. thing is lean in the most perfect ways. Uh, transfer on is great. But like the bonus material was like, I mean, you could just plow through it. You could go through that disc in a day, but it's. It's tight, but it's rich with material, like good stuff there. And, Thank you. Uh, that was that was yeah. so fun, man. And it was hard to have breaks on that one. And eventually mm-hmm. they kind of had to say stop. But it was great. We have the alternate opening, which I yeah. com- I completely agree with Jonathan, the director, Mostow, on why that was cut. Because he's like, I didn't want nothing. <laughs> anywhere near my film. Yeah, it was completely unnecessary. And and then, I mean, interviews with you know, the new commentary with Kurt Russell. Yeah. And Jonathan Mostow getting Kurt for a commentary was amazing. Yeah. Like the day we were all on pins and needles in case he didn't show up or something on the day of the recording. And he drives onto the lot and it's like, it's like phone tag. Like he's here. He's here. He's here. Like everybody's all rejoicing because he had shown up huh. and then he gets in there and he just had a blast. And man, it's just such, so good. Martha De Laurentiis, who most people haven't mm-hmm. ever seen interviews with before Dino's wife, widow. And then, um, Kathleen Quinlan, uh, another interview with Jonathan about just the film and its legacy and its history and production. So many great stories. I am so proud of that release. Thank you for the Dude, words. No. Uh, and the funny thing is like, you don't have an on-camera interview with Kurt Russell, but the people you got paint this wonderful picture of him. Yeah. And it's like awesome. And it's like, I, I'm just like, wow, I get why his marriage has lasted and works or his yeah. relationship with Goldie has worked. And I, you know, I, I, there was one story, and I'm not going to spoil it, about the kid who was the child actor in movies uh, growing up, and like that's his life. And you get to get that that's his a life right. for him uh, with right. the little story. I think Martha De Laurentiis tells it. Um, yeah. But I was just like, oh, that's adorable and really nifty. Or no, yeah. it, was, it was Kathleen Quinlan's story. That's her, it's her story. Well, uh, and well, Mar- Martha had a little bit about it too. Yeah. But Kathleen is the one who spoke to that moment yes. where she, yeah. That's yeah, cool. But that's a like pick people should pick it. Well, it's a great movie for one. That was a it's funny. It's one of those forgotten number ones at the box office kind mm. of where yeah. like time passed it by. But I'm like, it's a great movie. It's uh, awesome. every, every but when it comes up, everybody who's seen it loves it. Yeah. It's not a movie that has people who are kind of like eh. people are. Oh, man, I rem- that was really good. Like the tension in that mm-hmm. just ratchets up. And the way Mostow handled that, the pace of the film, it never slows down. You never get bored with it. 
And Kurt is just incredible. And it helped that he did most of his own stunts right. too in the picture, which is crazy. There's so many great stories on there about it. But he came right off Escape from L.A. Yeah. And walked directly <laughs> into this film. Snake Plissken shaves, right. shows up as the guy in the khaki pants and stuff in Breakdown. And it's just kind of mind blowing to think about that transition that he made from one character to another because he so perfectly embodies sort of the every man in this film. Yeah. That's why I think that alternate opening did his character a bit of a disservice if right. it would have been in there because it's too much. We mm -hmm. don't need more on him. Jeff is perfect as he is. Kurt Russell's amazing. Kurt Russell's amazing in everything. Well, and I also, I, in my review, I pointed out like Kathleen Quinlan, we only get like a couple scenes and a couple minutes with her at the beginning, but there's, she gives so much from yeah. so little time that you that helps to add that you want to find her, you want her to be alive and you can't wait to see her again. You're in yeah. Kurt's shoes because of what she's bringing. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's such a, yeah. Pick up that release breakdown. Yeah. Some great, great. behind the scenes stuff on there. Yeah. yeah Thank you, you. You, yeah, you've got a lot of great, I like, yeah, those Paramount presents are true gems. Um, ever, and I think they've improved every, every release they've come out, uh, since, since the start, but I, I look forward to those every single month yeah, and there's a lot of great releases coming up here so you'll yep. have to stay tuned man very exciting very exciting um but yeah I, I look forward to more that you have coming down the pike from shout factory and paramount and yeah, you've done some things for the others too right blue uh, have you done anchor or uh, arrow anchor bay years An ago anchor bay arrow years i'm starting ago. for soon was, okay yeah, I, I did. A, I sort of helped some a guy I know with a commentary a few years ago on an Arrow release, mm -hmm. but I um officially working for them starts next year gotcha. and doing some stuff I, I do for Vinegar Syndrome. Vinegar, that was it. OK. And yeah. it's a lot of editing for them now, too. They'll send nice. me stuff just to cut together. Like, in fact, tomorrow, as we're recording here, Blades comes out on Blu-ray, which is mm -hmm. an old trauma. It's just so much fun. It's it's a really genuine, loving tribute to Jaws mm -hmm. in the cheesiest, most awful and wonderful ways. It's it's worth the trip if you haven't seen Blades. But that was a fun one to cut. Like they just send me everything and then I assemble it. Nice. Made a documentary on it. So the, the vinegar stuff is fun to cut together. It's cool. fun. Uh, you, you had that story about Kurt Russell showing up for the, the deluxe thing. It reminded me when I worked mm -hmm. in the... Uh, I, back when I worked at Burbank, I worked in the deluxe building. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was a day where... Um, Pacino was coming to record a commentary on something mm -hmm. and we got put on notice that from this time to this time you were and this time to this time, like certain times you were not to leave your office you were not to go in the mm -hmm. halls yeah. you were not like like you couldn't nothing like when he got there he nobody was even allowed to be around yeah when he left nobody was allowed to be around I was like okay well I guess Al Pacino's in the building today but who would know yeah but I heard that crazy. years ago, there's a friend of mine that worked at, I think it was the, either the first or one of the early official kiss conventions mm -hmm. that they had. And they were, and he helped dress out one of the rooms with the costumes or the room with the costumes in it. And so they were putting him on mannequins and having it set up for different eras and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then they got word that Gene and Paul were going to come through to approve everything. And they said, when Gene, when, when Gene and Paul walk in, you all can be working, but you need to stop when we say that they're about to walk in and then you need to turn around and face away from them. So oh. don't, don't look at them. Don't make eye contact with them. And this guy, I worked with him in a record store and the kiss is his life. He was in a mm -hmm. kiss tribute band. He has Paul, a, a, a real ice man. I I mean, he was really vested into a lifetime of kiss love. And then he can't even look at these guys when they walk in the room. I still love kiss. I'm a huge fan myself. But that story to me was just like, man, why be, why be like that? Why, oh, yeah. why do that? Oh, that's like, oh gosh, now we're trading stories here. But um, yeah. so my wife in town here with her sister, she co-owns a um, nightclub known for like burlesque dancing and stuff called the mm -hmm. White Rabbit Cabaret. And one time they had uh, the Jake the Snake tour with Hacksaw oh. Jim Duggan came by. Oh, boy. And so we, we went to, we went to that and. Yeah. Jake the Snake when it there was like people got this they paid for this pass for this VIP thing and they were supposed to get a picture and his autograph. Oh, no. Well, when Jake the Snake got there, he said, "No, you get a picture or an autograph." And and there were like grown men crying, people like, "I don't know which to do," and just all the it was pandemonium and we we're this these grown men in their forties and fifties like just either upset trying to make life decisions about jake that it oh, was man. 
It was crazy. I'm like, this is this guy's hero. Yeah. And I interviewed him years ago. I yeah. did a piece, the a cover article for Fangoria and Alice Cooper. And mm. so I had this great sidebar. It was actually too big to eventually, it didn't even make it in the magazine because there was too much, it was too big. Mm -hmm. But I interviewed all these people that were a part of Alice's life, like John Carpenter. Oh, yeah. Jake the Snake Roberts. Um, a bunch of different people who he had done films with and whatever over the years. And the Jake interview was just not at all what I expected. And now mm -hmm. I look back and I've seen that there's a documentary about him called like the resurrection of Jake, the snake or something. Okay. Have you seen that? No, I heard, I've heard about it. I haven't seen it, but he had bad addiction issues and stuff yeah. like that. But I realized after seeing that a few years ago, that at the time when I talked to him, he was just in the bottoming out throes of addiction and mm. his family had been dismantled, but I, <laughs> I had that conversation with him, not at all expecting to get this heavy lesson in child abuse and all this other stuff. Cause oh, he went geez. into some deep, dark territory and I was talking to him and I'm just doing this sidebar about Alice Cooper. So <laughs> it was kind of, it was almost a little terrifying to yeah. have the discussion with him just cause I felt so bad. Right. I felt terrible for him. And those, oh my gosh. like what he had been through. And I'm like, what do I, what do I do with this? And then it didn't even end up getting published, which was a bummer. But anyway, Thanks. that's my Jake the snake story. <laughs> He met John at WrestleMania three. Oh, really? Jake the Snake met because John went. John's a huge wrestling fan. Yeah, and he went to WrestleMania three. Alice Cooper was at WrestleMania three, appearing with Jake because the Snake connection and all that. I, I don't know if I think Alice was in town on tour or something, and so he wanted to. Anyway, they worked out being a part of it, and so just so happens that backstage was John Carpenter, and he bumped into Alice Cooper and was like, "I'm a huge fan. I'd like to see you in concert." They see him in concert, then John's like, that was really great. You did this impalement gig during your live show. Can we do that in a film? I'm shooting this movie. I'd love to do that in it. And it was leading up to Prince of Darkness. And mm -hmm. that's so ultimately Prince of Darkness was born in a way. Alice Cooper being in <laughs> Prince of Darkness was born out of WrestleMania 3. Oh, that's Jake great. the Snake to, to Prince of Darkness. There's a story for <laughs> And when it came to They Live, he chose Roddy Piper. And shows Roddy Piper in John Carpenter's office. If yeah. you go to his office in Los Angeles, he doesn't have a lot of memorabilia stuff around. He has mm -hmm. scripts and he has lots of books and posters for his movies and things. But from other people, he doesn't have a whole lot except for a signed Roddy Piper figure. The G.I. Joe Roddy, Roddy Piper figure. Oh, wow. you remember that? Mm -hmm. He has one of those signed from Roddy to John wow. up on his shelf in his office. Yeah, that's how big a fan he is. That's right. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's his non Lakers sport that he right. goes for. Totally. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, well, we will move on to Sorcerer. All right. From uh, 1977, directed by William Friedkin, uh, written by Waylon Green from the novel The Wages of Fear by George uh, Arnaud, starring Roy Scheider, Bruno Kremer, Francisco Rabal, Amadou, Joe Spinell, and Anne Marie Deschot. It's uh, about four unfortunate men from different parts of the globe agree to risk their lives transporting gallons of nitroglycerin across dangerous Latin American jungle. Uh, so this is um, so this week on the show, and we're on Thursday now. Uh, I've it's been uh, uh, unique favorite films of mine to reflect on. Uh, the past year with guests always bring in a new, a new, uh, a unique film of theirs. That's a favorite. This one sorcerer is probably my favorite of all these this week. Mm. Easily. Wow. Um, what else is on the lineup? If you don't mind. My oh, asking. it was, uh, we had blood and black lace on Monday, uh, Bucktown Tuesday, uh, Wednesday sound of my voice. Try to get oh, cool. different eras and stuff in there. Nice. So, Real diverse, man. Yeah. Try to yeah. try to try to do that. But uh, yeah. Sorcerer and Sorcerer hasn't been with me that long. That's the thing. I first saw this in 2014 when it came out on Blu-ray. Mm. It was a new to me film from that year. And it hasn't left my mind since. Yeah. It just stuck with me. And I probably watch it one to two times a year. And I don't wow. get the chance to go, always go back to films like that. But mm -hmm. I don't know what this is with this film. But um, I wanted to watch it earlier, but I had found I snotty here. Um, it was always four by three cropped pan and mm -hmm. scan and yeah. just a bad trans. There were some rights issues with this film that freaking mm -hmm. lost the rights. The studio lost the rights. Who knew where they were? And he finally in like 2013 or something, got them back, restored it, put it back out um, properly um, with a Blu-ray from Warner Brothers. But I didn't see it till 2014. But I did, and it's been a powerhouse for me 
since. So I would love to hear, I mean, knowing all that, hearing that, I got to tell you, I've never seen the movie before. Right. I hadn't, I hadn't seen it prior to this, but I ordered the same Blu-ray that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I've seen it as it should look, which is great. Right. And it looks amazing. I mean, it's a beautiful Blu-ray. Hearing that when you first watched it, what was your initial impression of it? Like, what did you walk away with? Or what was it an immediate sort of acknowledgement of attraction to this thing or fascination with it? What was it? It was, I, there was like a feeling that I, I was just into it. Um, I felt the one thing I, I was impressed with the production of it. Like mm -hmm. that was one big thing. I'm like, how did nobody die making this movie? Yeah. Um, it looked, even on my screen I have at home, it felt like I was in a theater. It feels huge. And if I had a, if I had a choice of a movie to reformat for IMAX and show it as big as possible, I'd love to see this that way. That yeah. and that the shining uh, would be great oh, to, to, to see that way as well. Uh, yeah. But this is up there with that in terms of seeing it. And it just, I love movies where a direct, cause this is his, I won best director for French connection. I just made one of the most profitable movies ever with The Exorcist. Here's his blank check movie. And mm. I love when to see what a director can do. And this is the 70s when these guys were running the town. Yeah. And I love it when they just go unhinged. And this was his crazy, I'm going to do what I want. And Freakin was already a frictional kind of director. Sure. Anyway. And this is what he came up with. And it's just unhinged. It's, there's something real about it. Um, there's suspense. There's just, I don't know. Technically, I think most of it was like, I can't believe someone made this. Like this is asking a lot of everyone involved in the film from your actors yeah. to your tech people mm -hmm. to just probably the catering for coming down to where they were shooting. And I just can't believe it's all in film that nobody died. It looks dangerous. It looks impressive. Yeah. And and the movie bombed, <laughs> but yeah. Um, well, it came out the week after Star Wars, I yeah, think. Yeah, and so mm -hmm. it suffered a, an ugly fate. This kind of cerebral darkness yeah. doesn't really play well. It reminded me in some. It reminded me of a number of films. It reminded me primarily what came to mind is Deer Hunter, mm. tonally okay. and with the the way that the. The conflict between people is handled, what mm -hmm. violence there is, the way that it's handled very realistically yeah. throughout the whole thing. It's frank presentation of the resonance and the repercussions of things like gang involvement, um, war, mm -hmm. religion. There's so much in play here. So he's when you talk about it being his here's a blank check movie, he's putting a lot into this. He's, yeah. he's really cramming a bunch of genres into one film. And what I loved about it and watching it, I know I'm sure we'll get there, is that this thing takes several very direct left turns. It becomes a different movie twice Yeah. as you're watching it. So it begins as one thing, then transitions to something else, and then transitions to something completely different, which blew me away. Yeah. So it's such a strange film. It's such a unique thing. I can see why you love it and why you're fascinated with it. Yeah. And it, I mean, it even has the weirdness of, the first image of the movie is kind of like him going, yeah, I'm the guy who did the exorcist. Like it's got yeah. that demonic rock thing. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah. Hey, remember me? Let's yeah. go on a ride again or something like that. Well, I remember reading something about this years ago. I've known of it for mm -hmm. a while, but I've never, but I just hadn't taken the time to seen it, see it. But I remember reading that there was some controversy about him, just him being there where they were shooting. Cause they shot in Mexico. I think right. a lot of this film. And I remember reading about the fact that he had a hard time, with some locals, once they found out who he was, they were superstition or superstitious about him even being in their presence, being in their town, being right. in their villages and stuff like that. That's how big the exorcist was. It turned this man into a demon in some parts of the world. That's remarkable. Right. Yeah. And the exorcist, I mean, there's a huge factor with the exorcist that I never had contemplated before. I read this book called The Big Goodbye, which came out a year or two ago. Hmm. Uh, Chronicles primarily uh, making Chinatown, but um, it covers kind of the era. And there's a point where the exorcist becomes the gigantic hit it was. Mm. And they're all like, and someone as soon as like, it's over, like things are never going to be the same. But like, why? Like we used to live on our own out here in California, the people in New York, 
the people over they're seeing the money that these a movie can make with this one mm. and they're going to want to make they're going to come here and they're going to ch- and that's kind of how it was it, it i don't the movie the book kind of sounds like it's pointing a finger and blaming the exorcist but that's the one that caught people because i don't think people realize that that movie would have been bigger than any of our big movies now if you inflate it yeah like it's that big that. and he was yeah he was a household he wasn't with the film brat guy or the uh, film school brat guys, but he got thrown in with them. Mm-hmm. Um, the Coppola and Lucas and all them. Like he right. started a company with Bogdanovich and Coppola, and the weird, bitter kind of karma. Like Coppola wanted them to produce Star Wars, and Friedkin and Bogdanovich turned it down and said, "No, this ain't gonna do anything." Wow. And then guess what kills his big opus? Yeah, here, which was a very hyped up movie for that summer people were looking forward to it but then star wars came out and kneecaps it and it's history yeah i yeah. mean even the blu-ray is bare bones the one that i got it's got like yeah. nothing on it and i'm like there's no one to want to talk about this thing there's so uh, many yeah. fascinating elements to it from production design to the logistics of the locations and everything right it's, it's like, wild there's a big story and his book the freakin connection which i i recommend it's uh, he he's quite honest in it, uh, but he kind of brushes over this one. Really, it's not as much as I would have liked. He goes into good detail on cruising, which I would have thought that would have been the one he skipped over. Mm. But he brushes over this one quite a little bit. But well, that film's discussed. I think that cruising is definitely discussed mm-hmm. among people, and it's very much. I mean, it's 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 sort of evergreen in mm-hmm. its relevance in a lot of ways, but yeah. This one, it, it, I think it's tough to have a film that follows something, and I even have it playing over here. That's why I keep sort of glancing over there once in a while. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's tough to have a, a movie that that follows something so massive. I think right. it's tough to be the creative behind it in any role, and I think it's also tough to have to sort of own that and then take the next step because it raises the bar so high for you. And I, I, I can see in this film him pouring a lot of of uh, commentary on society on a lot of different elements and uh, but yet at the end i don't know how satisfying this would be to general audiences i don't know right. if they're if they would go to see sorcerer and get much out of it right no yeah i don't know it's a it's a big deep movie but it's i think it's good enough as a thriller it works as a silent film even there's like a lot of it's essentially silent you, it is essentially i mean there's dialogue and stuff and it opens with it it's true to country where it's subtitled they had to put mm-hmm. signs outside theaters um after a couple of weeks being open being like hey this is not a foreign film oh, wow. you will not hear something in the english language until the 20 something minute mark or mm. even longer than that because we That's got interesting we open with four prologues which is yeah. interesting but it's uh, storytelling wise it's it's marvelous because we now are ahead of the characters in terms of when we get to the crux of the the film because we know where each of them came from but they don't right we know what they're all capable of yeah um and but but they have no idea but they just mm-hmm. know them face value in this little town yeah. that that they are but um but yeah they had to warn people all this but yeah it's a film yeah yeah i don't know that they would they would never make it this way today and they had freaking not been the director he was probably wouldn't have got it made that way back then either yeah yeah i, I, I like these pet project movies from mm-hmm. directors i really do i was almost doing a thing on um reds oh, okay we were in preparation forever on it and it's something that I don't know that it is ever going to happen at this point with all the stuff that we had in queue on it for Paramount. But uh, have you seen Reds? Long ago, I worked on a, one, I think the initial Blu-ray for it or was it a DVD? Has it been on Blu-ray? It was on Blu-ray. It was an anniversary edition. Okay. Like I, 10 I years worked ago. on that one long, like probably 2007 or something like that. I worked oh, okay. on that one. What'd you do? Uh, just a QC quality control um, oh, okay. party um, doing a, probably it would have been a linear pass doing that. One, yeah. But. Got it. Well, we, I mean, that's another movie where Warren Beatty, I mean, that was, that was his passion project. Mm-hmm. This is something that he had to convince people into. And when, and he had these fascinating interviews with all these people that were, he referred to as the witnesses in that film. 
Okay. And and you realize that Reed, the central figure in the movie played by him, mm-hmm. even though this entire film is about this guy, Jack Reed, the world really didn't know who he was. Mm-hmm. He wasn't a well-known player on the world stage. And so it was a really unique thing to push as a project for him because people are like, who is this again? And even those that, because Warren went around the world, the country mostly, but interviewing these people, he put this sort of cast a wide net saying, if you knew this guy, if you were associated with communist revolution, contact me, we want to talk to you. And he started interview, going, traveling to these people to interview them in their homes and whatever. And I think only maybe four or five of them even know who Jack Reed was. Oh, wow. So it kind of undermined his concept that he had. He would try to redirect the questions. It's interesting to watch this stuff, redirect the questions back to try to find it. Anyway, that movie is the least obvious thing for a studio to bankroll and then mm-hmm. to release. And they st- and everyone still kind of struggles with it now. Everyone being audiences, even Warren, he has these very, he, he's very passionate about this movie and what should happen with it next what should yeah. be associated with it and what, what he wants to do with all this archival stuff that he has. And the rest of the world is just kind of going like, we don't, we still don't know if this is worth, we don't know if this is like, what can be done with this? How, how viable this would be as a product for people today. So anyway, Friedkin doing this, I think was a, a pretty bold move mm-hmm. to move into this realm and, and make something like this. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, and and he got his his uh documentary style feel comes into like full effect with this one that he always likes to pat himself on the back for introducing into cinema a lot of time um but with that just grounded you feel hot where they're at you feel mm-hmm. the temperature you feel uh the tension and everything and he's just got little i mean little just looks and stuff that are really interesting like when uh, Roy Scheider, when we first see him after he's been transplanted uh, into hiding, mm-hmm. and he gets up in the morning and he goes to wash his hands and he looks out the window and there's a guy looking down at him and you're like, oh, crap, he's you know being spied on. But then we mm-hmm. change perspective to that guy and that guy is looking at him like he's looking at me. Yeah. But they have, And you get kind of a good sense of this world um, that I really like. Um, and I, I don't know. It's There's good character wo- work with almost one would think thin characters, but mm-hmm. I feel that they're pretty rich mm-hmm. um, with what the actors bring to them um, through each of the, the four vignettes the, uh, the and things are left ambiguous uh, with some of them, like the, the assassin guy yep. uh, with the mustache, which uh, I thought this time, this time around, I, something hit me with this film that never hit me before. Uh, I don't know if maybe you thought it already once in, but, I was wondering, I was like, was he sent there to kill Roy Scheider? And then he heard of the the job and is like, well, I'll make this money, kill him. I'll bankroll all this stuff and have done my job because he comes later yeah. to there. He's the first, he's the only one that we see arrive there. We know he's been a hired hitman before that guy, the mob boss wants Roy Scheider dead here. He shows up. And then he never comes back. So that's when the other guys come at the end. So I was like, yeah. I wonder if he was sent there to kill Roy Scheider. Cause I always thought he was just hiding himself, but then I'm like, well, this that's guy looks like he knows how to get, out. this guy looks like he knows how to get out of places. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I was like, this time around, I was like, what if he was sent to kill Roy Scheider? Yeah. But, that's an interesting perspective. I don't think Scheider was the original. I don't think he was the original choice to even star like the, in this. He was like the 10th choice. Uh, Freakin said like none of it. The only, the only first choice he got was the guy who um, played the bomber. Um, that was it. Everybody else was getting people passing. Hmm. Um, like Steve McQueen was. Oh, that's right. And he wouldn't His write his choice. Yeah. And he, he loved it. Didn't he? Didn't he actually like really like the script when he read it? Yep. Yeah, but uh, Freakin wouldn't budge and he wanted a role added for Ali McGraw. His and, wife, right? Yep. And yeah, he, okay. he's like, there's no spot for her in this. And he's like, mm. well, nope. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't travel to go do this. Like there was, there was some big name. I want, I want to say now wouldn't Cameron Mitchell, someone, some big name, more seventies based star. Mm. I was like, 
make it in Los Angeles, I'll do it. And he's like, no, I'm going to the real place to do it. Because Friedkin's big on real. He'll cast yep. real life people. Like one of the guys in the car at the beginning and escape uh, the heist with uh, Roy mm-hmm. Scheider is one of the guys, the uh, French connections kind of based off of and was an onset uh, advisor for that. And he's a real cop. Oh, wow. He, or no, there's like a real crook or something copper crook one of the two mm. but um yeah he included him in that movie and he liked and he i think he had a real priest in the exorcist was one of the cast i yeah. think so he likes to get that sense of real people being in those roles right well and i think that it's smart ultimately it works in his favor to have Scheider in here because of jaws yeah and because people felt so close to him in that movie mm-hmm. people i mean you spend the running time of that film essentially just with him it's sort of his story and yeah. and the time that you get to spend with him the way that spielberg so expertly handled that was you're seeing family time you're seeing work time you're seeing him fail you're seeing him make bad calls see him mean, it's you see his place in town in the culture there so he is to your point a real he's a real character in a lot of people's minds just based yeah. on that role alone. So him walking into this makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. And he's, he's just so one, he's so great. He's so great at natural intensity. When he gets angry, it feels like someone in the room angry. It doesn't feel like an actor putting that on. Yeah. And he's I don't know a, if that's because we feel so acquainted with him or what. Right. He's a phenomenal performer that I just, I miss that there's nobody that there's no, Roy Scheider today like he's completely to him to himself and like I feel I didn't realize that till later on going back to getting older I'm like man this guy's brilliant um mm. but he um he was supposed to be Father Karras in the Exorcist which, right to which Friedkin said nah he's not a lead he's not a leading man he's not yeah. a leading man and then here he is like guess what I'm a leading man now right yeah. um but you know I was thinking like what they do with him in Jaws is similar to what like Toby Hooper does with Craig T. Nelson and Poltergeist later, which is a Spielberg uh, produced thing as well. But that mm-hmm. he's kind of got that thing with um, the family dad guy that they're able to yeah. to bring across. But Scheider was the first of such. Yeah. I and, like that he spends time with those people in that way. Mm-hmm. And in a way it serves that actor from that point forward. I think that that sort of informs how people embrace them from that point on. And in this film, it's a similar thing. So you're already feeling for him when you see him. Like, you don't really mm-hmm. know. And then they put him in a situation where he's not on the right side of the law. Right. And then something incredibly gory happens. And, whoa, left turn. And then we move on to the crux, like the main core of the film when they move into the, the trip. That whole journey that they go on with the truck, the sorcerer, I mean, it's it it becomes dual, but it's not man versus another man, man mm-hmm. versus another vehicle. Although at one point it kind of is, it's really man versus nature. And it's with, with that bomb under the table that Hitchcock yeah. liked to talk about, like, you know, the bomb is there. The audience know it's, knows it's there and every single movement on screen, you're worrying about the fate of them because you know, that's present. So even if it wasn't just a bridge giving way, you know yeah. that's in the back there. So any moment could become catastrophic for everyone involved. And it's, it's yeah, it's like the last hour of this movie is a just suspense trip because for the people listening that may have not seen the movie, but you like to hear me and Justin talk, well, uh, that there's a oil rig that blows up and the only way to stop the fire is to put some dynamite in it. And the only dynamite they have is old and rickety dripping nitroglycerin and any sudden movement will make it explode And they have to go 200 miles to take it to the oil rig to put out the fire. So they get these two rickety, huge trucks, um, take three boxes of dynamite in each of them in sand in it. And they have to drive this 200 miles through just Latin American jungle and mountains and all sorts of things, hoping they don't shake and blow up. And they pick four guys who happen to be our four guys from the prologues to do so. And so it's an untrustworthy bunch. They're all some sort of criminals or they aren't as tough as you think they are. Uh, and they got to go through some challenges. Um, and it's, it's exciting to watch like each one, like the first ones, there's like a, there's like a bridge where they have to go around a corner mm-hmm. and drive slowly. The bridge is falling apart underneath them. Like, apart. Yeah. Uh, the big one is this river 
with a mm-hmm. one of those you know those draw bridges they have on playgrounds or whatever but it's all beat up and this thing they took them three months to shoot this mm. and it's insane to watch just it's on and, the poster it's yeah in that article that i read some time ago an interview with him he where again he didn't mention very much about it mm-hmm. i remember him saying that this does that this film had the most terrifying thing in it that he had ever shot in his life this like the most terrifying sequence that he ever had to do mm-hmm. was this one on the bridge in yeah. this film so and that there's no question about it when you're watching and that's that is a that scene makes you feel that's the one that's i think the most reminiscent for me of deer hunter Okay. One of the things that's most reminiscent because those guys have something kind of similar happen where they're hung up in this river, caught on a bridge and this helicopter is trying to get them. Mm-hmm. And these actors almost died in real life shooting that scene who are in it, John Savage. Um, and I interviewed him for it. And he was just like, it was, it was, it was mayhem. It mm-hmm. was terrifying. And they said, go up there. And then they, the helicopter, when they went to lift it, not to get on a different movie, but they went to fly away mm-hmm. the little, what you call it, the runners underneath the helicopter or whatever got caught on the one of the steel braided um, cables that was holding the bridge up. And, mm-hmm. it, and the guys were still on the bridge holding on, like climbing onto the helicopter. And so the helicopter was like, wait, I'm stuck on something. So it just went up and it sort of snapped and the bridge snapped down and shot up. And so that almost got them. And then when they were up in the air, they made them jump out of the helicopter down into the water from I don't know how many hundreds of feet up in the air. And I talked to um oh, the seventies. <laughs> oh yeah. Well anyway, oh, I mean I I won't go on about that, but when no, you watch this stuff, it, it oh. and then when you and you know they're shooting in Mexico mm-hmm. and you know that the regulation around this stuff is so not what most actors are used to working in. Right. And so you just think about how terrifying it must have been for everybody for real. In addition, I mean on top of Friedkin being terrified yeah. of the whole thing yeah and yeah just there yeah, you mentioned deer hunter and I, I think they share a shot where um the one falls through the bridge and goes underwater isn't there like a similar shot in deer hunter where they're at the little i think someone falls through when they're in the uh roulette little entrapment place i think mm. there might be a similar shot where someone falls and the camera just goes from a little like oh it goes down into the water like yeah. yeah just it was similar movement i'm my mind's going there, but I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, this does what dual does and that's ratchet mm-hmm. up the tension as you're going the entire time. And it, the, the magic in this is, is the nitroglycerin in the back of the truck. And you, because it, yeah, it makes every moment a cliffhanger moment. And they show us little shots of it just shifting a little bit in the sand. You're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, one of the coolest things too, is after the, the bridge, there's the, um, there's they come up to a a big law a big tree has fallen and mm-hmm. guess what well we have dynamite we have and we can it do up. it and the just the piecing together the macgyver thinking they have like cutting the pockets out to like like i don't know i would ever thought of that with the mm-hmm. sand just slowly giving them time and it has one of the coolest explosions i've ever seen in a movie that oh, tree yeah. just yeah yeah uh, that when they first arrive on the tree and who is it? Um, I don't know if it's Victor or Nino. I don't remember who, but just leans back and looks, sees the tree and just starts laughing. Mm-hmm. Like, like we've made it this far. You got to be kidding me. This Roy is, Scheider course, goes nuts. And he's like, yeah. Oh. And he goes absolutely berserk, starts punching the ground. Mm-hmm. He's, he loses his mind on it. But that's like, this is, this is what's going to stop them. They did yeah. make it this far. This is what's going to stop them. It's brilliant. And, and Scheider starts to unravel then. And that, once he's especially alone in the truck, mm-hmm. then it becomes a one like man versus nature kind of a yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. He's back to facing Bruce in a way. It's like the man versus the shark, but this is not just an animal in the in the ocean. This is the entire ecosystem around him, essentially doing bad battle with him, trying yeah. to make him not survive this. Well, they also it's have in, it's incredible man versus man too because they get there's some mercenary guys yeah. that pull him over and they kill the. Um, the assassin guy and Mm -hmm. that's a really dangerous moment as well and that right before he goes solo with the man versus nature and the really kooky because they don't eat and he's dehydrated and he's because i was thinking i'm like wait they probably didn't even pack food he's like hey let's go and yeah that when he runs out of gas and carries to the finish going mad with a beautiful shot of of the 
the dunes. oil on fire and the dune yeah the dune yeah. The, the color scheme changes and well like, that's that left turn so it goes from yeah the, it goes from the beginning this action film that's set up through these different sequences and then you move into uh their sort of new identity era mm -hmm. for that final one and then it's on to the journey which is this whole battle versus nature and these harrowing situations but then it takes another sharp turn into this sort of other world mm -hmm. all of a sudden and then you're starting to question is this reality is this are we in his head did he really die because because yeah. Friedkin also toys with the audience with some flashback shots throughout that sequence right where Scheider's thinking back well he could be thinking back and he like sort of replaying how did I get here how did I end up in this situation where I am but also it's doing kind of that carnival of souls thing where you start to wonder by that point yeah did he really die and I think that's a brilliant move on Friedkin's part, the way that he handled that. And that it really plays like three movies, the, mm -hmm. the beginning and then that long journey sequence, the bulk of it. And then this whole fantasy, psycho, I don't mean to say psychedelic, but he's, he's um, imagining things all around him. And you're in his head, almost black and white, void of color, including his face. Yeah. And then you move out of that. So that's a, that's a fascinating term yeah. in this film that I did not expect. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. It's so many. Yeah, you just don't know where this. Like as as streamlined as it is, point A to point B. Please get there. Mm -hmm. It takes all these turns that you just don't know, and the the type of movie it becomes, and the different. It it it's definitely does have a lot of different, like you said, action movies. But it's like a bunch of different kinds of action movies can show yeah. up here in this movie as well. Right, and character studies, and well, that's and that's one of the things Friedkin's so good at, and he he leaves you with people mm -hmm. he he trusts the audience to spend time with these people and so you're in quiet moments you're seeing um scanlon scheider's character you're seeing him in, in, in learning his environment uh, trying to figure out where he is what resources he has and just sort of absorbing everything around him when he's like standing in the grove of trees when he's starting to have the breakdown and he's looking around just you you spend so much time with him in those moments i think that's just that's it's a brilliant way to drag us in and to to put us in his in his pocket really yeah. it's it's an ensemble but he's clearly the lead guy because he's mm -hmm. like maybe the least bad of the he's just a wheelman for yeah different crime syndicates and stuff but he gets pinned on for a, a murder at a church uh by a, the local mob boss the other guy one's a you know one's a freedom fighter type bomber guy like a revolutionary mm -hmm. one is an assassin and one is uh probably some more money financial swindling guy which is funny because when you get to the the village and stuff with him it's like he's gonna go on this he's the pampered frenchman that's mm -hmm. like and he's going to go the tough route job thing. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. It's but, kind of like Cutthroat's Nine, where everybody is to be distrusted. Mm -hmm. Everybody there. So there's no comfort level with anyone. He's as close as you get because you get to see the most humanity in him because he keeps surviving these things. Once yeah. you keep, like, he makes it through this, then he makes it through that. Now, okay, he's got the new, okay, now he's going to have to do this. It just becomes a, you become a cheering section for this guy, mm -hmm. even though he's a criminal. Even yeah. though he, you know, he is what he ultimately is. Yeah. It's the characters of the seventies that they were exploring. Totally. Like I just, I just did a Blu-ray review for a, a new to me, another new to me one I liked called straight time with Dustin Hoffman, where he plays mm -hmm. a, he plays a uh, guy who just ex con trying to get himself in society, but like, like a drug pulling heist is like his addiction or robbing and stuff. And he starts getting his old band gang back together. It's very much funny enough reminding me of thief the michael mann film a bit hmm. and then i found out michael mann did an uncredited rewrite on straight time oh. three years before thief Interesting. so i'm like oh okay well this makes sense now this is proto thief yeah then but that's a really cool one but yeah these are the type of characters these the anti-heroes which now we get on tv all the time with like your tony sopranos your walter whites mm -hmm. those are the the film guys of the the 1970s and you get four of them here basically yeah yeah um, but then um but this um also what point i can't, can't go without forgetting this is the like breakout for well breakout of the movie bomb but uh american breakout for tangerine dream the oh, love it which is 
I love this score. And that's one thing that draws me into when I, it's not what you're expecting. When you see this movie, if you see the trailer and you look mm-hmm. at it, this is not the kind of score you might be expecting, mm-hmm. but it's brilliant and works oh, yeah. for it and it blasts off. And um, yeah, and it's weird. Like, um, it's kind of weird. There's a, there's been rumor there's a freaking Michael Mann rivalry kind of thing with stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because he uses Tangerine Dream. Man will use Tangerine mm-hmm. Dream. There's the William Peterson uh, thing with Manhunter and to live and die in LA. Mm. They use it's, it's kind of weird where those two touch upon each other yeah. a little bit, but um, but yeah, the, this score. I'm a huge fan of Tangerine Dream, and I realized watching it that I knew the music, and I didn't had never seen the picture the film before mm. because of Tangerine Dream, gotcha. and they're just so great. I mean, even little films that they contribute something simple to, like mm-hmm. Dead Kids, which is also known as Strange Behavior. Um, I just I, I love that score so much in that movie for its simplicity and all that it is and isn't that I and then it's not available anywhere. Right. And I even wrote I went to this I uh, found like fan message boards years ago trying to track down some sort of score. Has this been released in any country? Is there vinyl anywhere? Is there anything anywhere for this movie? Mm-hmm. And everyone's like, no, it just doesn't exist. And so I recorded it from my TV years ago and you know very primitively and i had yeah. the cd that i would carry and i'd like go on road trips and it was one of my regular listens oh, is awesome. the sort of janky start and stop soundtrack <laughs> that i cobbled off of uh like off the old school ones where my, maybe a little dialogue comes in yeah exactly yeah, yeah. which i you know and I, and I love that i remember that i always say the name wrong verisande sarabande the, the big film score releasing label that's done all the carpenter stuff mm-hmm. historically i mean they're I always say it wrong, but anyway, they, for a while, were doing some of those where it's a sort of natural born killers type approach to these movies where you listen to the soundtrack and it's blending dialogue and it's okay. chronological. So you're experiencing the film in your home or in your car or wherever you're listening. I remember that they did Halloween 1978 is one that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. And they had Alan Howarth going and sort of reverse engineer some sound effects and everything for it, oh, some cool. sound design to make it complete. But you really listen to the film yeah. through that kind of soundtrack, which is so neat. Anyway, that's what I did with Dead Kids, Back to Tangerine Dream, because I'm just such a huge fan of theirs. And I love their live stuff where they just wander through these songs and they're all like 20 minutes long. They're, they're really wonderful. Vangelis yeah. and Tangerine Dream are two that I just can never tire of. And frequent companions for my writing over the years, too. There you go. Great atmosphere. I remember after, after I saw this movie in 2014, I... I got the two disc score for it like mm. right right away i was like i i need that and it was my driving music for so good quite some time and i think tangerine dream was set to be uh one of the planets in hodorowski's dune when he was producing that in the 70s mm. and um because he was going to do different artists musical artists were going to be different planets or star systems in that movie so when you went there in that version of dune it would be Tangerine Dream. Yeah. I can't remember. Can't remember. One of the other ones was a really, I think, I think Bowie might have been one of the planets. Mm. I'm not sure. But, and it's weird, like that production of Hodorowski's Dune doesn't happen, but it breaks off into all these like alien oh, comes from it. That documentary and, is amazing yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's unreal. But um, it influenced everything, Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. I mean, because they made that lookbook on it. Right. That was really thorough. And they just started handing them out at will to whoever would take them. And next thing you know, every it like birth sci fi. It really birthed modern sci fi for a movie Someone that didn't exist. They need to make a coffee table book of it. Like some of they need to oh, make I wish a coffee. They would. I would, I'd pay more than healthy. That's healthy. Oh, man. For a but can you imagine book. the like Giger's estate, how much that would probably cost to do it? I just, it, ha- there has to be a reason why it doesn't exist because plenty of people still have them. Yeah, and they're they're definitely out there, and some of he's that art got has two. I think out. I think he said he has two of them. Or really, Rosky does. Yeah, he's got two yeah. of them. But just oh gosh, that'd be great. Just to because yeah. you can't look at it like you can't understand Hodorowski's Dune. I know, I know. Uh, but, that documentary is amazing. Anyone just look up. It's called that Hodorowski's Dune. Mm-hmm. Buy it. Don't even rent it. Just buy it because you're going to want to revisit it for its complexity. And the breakdown, the brilliant animation that they're using to sort of bring some of it to life through right. some of those, some of it the concept me, art. I'm like, can someone animate Horoski's Dune? I'll take an animated version yeah. of it, please. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Which is funny because that documentary, while his Dune like spread out there, there's been so many. We didn't make this movie, but here's a documentary on what we tried to do. Now there's mm-hmm. like there's a one about Superman Lives, yep. uh, which is good, which is really yeah. good. That's a good that, one too. I would have loved for that movie to be made. Make an animated one. Yeah, Cage man. will do it. Cage will do it. He he was the voice. Of, they brought him in to be the voice of Superman on Justice League. Mm-hmm. for some justice league movie or something that they did, they did uh, teen titans superman. go he did oh, teen uh, titans that yeah was it. he did okay. that one which is a funny yeah. movie i thought it was pretty yeah. funny um but yeah that yeah tangerine dream comes from that uh this movie just uh the the end of the movie um i picked up on like if you'll notice like roy scheider when he arrives at the little tavern mm-hmm. he's dressed in white and that's typically mm-hmm. like passing att- like i'm i'm moving on attire yeah um which is uh, significant and then he has that little last dance and then his buddy and then one of the mob guys shows up and you hear a gunshot and it's over yep but and they and they spare us that moment freaking yeah. spares us the seeing our hero not mm-hmm. hero our anti-hero however you want to say right. it seeing him die because we spend the whole movie so concerned that he's going to die yeah and when it finally happens it's kind of interesting that he did that off screen where you're not actually yeah. seeing it. You just hear the gunshot. I thought that was poignant. That leaves you sitting there like, Jesus. And now we've survived so much, and this is the way we're going to go. We kind of yeah. go like him. We end our relationship with this film the same way he does with this whole experience. He's got this like touching moment. Like he's he's upset because he he can't take the money that he's given because he wrote him a check and he needs cash because he's not Juan Dominguez, which is his name mm-hmm. on this in this town. And uh, he's like, I told you I need cash. And then he's like, just looks over and he, he goes to dance with uh, the little woman who works in the tavern. Mm-hmm. And then, then the dark 1970s ending happens, which yeah. it's at the wrong time. Like at right here, it starts with Rocky the year before, but mm-hmm. things get more uplifting towards the end of that decade because you yeah. have Rocky, Star Wars, Superman. Things start moving up more upbeat mm-hmm. towards the ending where a lot of the 70s were like, this is life. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah. That was- yeah. Here's deliverance. Deal with it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh like- God. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a it's a bleak ending, but it's a poignant ending, and I think mm-hmm. it it makes a huge statement about kind of man's fa- fallibility. The fact that we all ultimately have to go, and no matter how hard you might toil, no matter how much you might want to, how much you kick back against what you think are the like whatever the forces are aging us challenging yeah. us physically disease whatever it might be like we can defeat a million things but at the end of the day we're all going to suffer the same fate yeah which is kind of what i see as the statement in the end of this film yeah it's a tough ending but it was a it's a heck of a journey yeah. um to to watch this film like and i it's beautiful I, I will say like i showed it to my nine-year-old son because i was like ah, let's see what he thinks hmm. was not into the prologue stuff but once they took off in those trucks he changed his tune and was like, yeah. you know, that first hour, I I, I didn't think I, I didn't really like it. But once yeah. they took off in those trucks, that movie was amazing. I was like, all right, cool. So no. half of it works for you and you'll yeah. appreciate the other half when you get older, which yep. I'm, I'm doing this weird experiment with him where I'm going to I'm showing him vertigo at different points in his life. So I, mm. I did the first time last year and I'm going to wait a couple of years and we're going to go do it again. Cause I think that's a movie that every time you see it, there's it's different. It's like always almost a new movie. Mm. It's so weird. And I think at different points in your life, you see it in a different way. So um, he was eight last year when you showed it to him. What I'll did probably, he think of it? He thought it looked really nice. Um, he enjoyed, I could tell he was like, he respected it, but he wasn't quite as into it. There were parts he was really into, uh, but then the, like, oh, for like the next couple of weeks, he'd, he'd quote it or mm. say, remember just like in vertigo like this or with, like, so it, it stuck with him a bit. Um, but then like, I'll probably, when he's 13, I'll show it to him. And then like, little just to see where it hits him in different points how did you present it to him did you present it in a way like dad loves this movie i'd like you to check it out and see what you think or did you just sort of blank slate it and say want to watch a movie oh mm -hmm. here's one how did it go it's not even my favorite hitchcock um but like i just was like it's just an interesting one like that because i through film history over time it's been that way it was not liked when it came out um Mm -hmm. but i just told him i'm like hey you know alfred hitchcock because i think he'd seen the birds at that point i had showed him that okay this is one of his films i don't i said it's this long 
I'd like you to sit and watch it. I'd like to know what you think. It might not, I don't think it's going to connect with you right away, but kind of look at it. It's a really pretty looking movie. Um, but let's just go through it. And then I'd like to re watch it again, not soon, but in like in a few years or something. And then mm-hmm. we'll see what your opinion is. Interesting. And then there, and he's like, okay. And I could, I could tell he was a little restless during it, but he, he did it and he res- kind of respected it, but I, I could tell it wasn't really his thing yet, but yeah. then we'll revisit it again. Um, You're brave, man. I wouldn't, I mean, my kid's 10. I don't think I would probably even sit down <laughs> and watch Vertigo with him. Yeah. So I don't I tried, know. And then I, he got to watch, I showed him Psycho a couple months later and he really dug that. So, oh, wow. Yeah. He was, I was, yeah. Well, he's liking the Hitchcock stuff. So I was yeah. like, all right, well, we'll get the big ones. We'll yep. throw the big guns out there. But um, I, at some point, uh, like I want to do that with like Blade Runner, because in my life, Blade Runner has been mm. something different to me every every step of the way. Same here. And it's, it's just an amazing movie in that fashion. And then 2049 oh, comes to that. And I, I'm obsessed more. with 2049. I love it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so good. Oh. And then maybe 30 years, we'll get some other bite, but he's going to take a stab at yeah. Blade Runner. I was excited because I thought that they were going to, I mean, this also touches on the whole G- Dune thing, you know, is inspiring mm-hmm. Blade Runner. But I, they were supposed to be doing this animated series or something with Blade Runner. Mm. And it was teased in the Blu-ray of or the 4K. Maybe it's just the 4K. I don't know. But when 2049 came out on disc, it had a special feature thing in there, like a preview of this animated series. And I, I have to admit, I'm so busy. There were some I had, shorts, I think. There were some shorts, but it was supposed to become a thing. And mm, maybe it was okay. an insert in the, in the case that says, like, coming soon hmm, is this okay. thing. And then I remember seeing something relatively recently, some rumblings online about it becoming, uh, coming to fruition or something. Okay. But I haven't heard anything since. So you're you're much more dialed in than I am. Have you heard anything about that? No, no, I haven't. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't mind if they did like a like an animatrix type thing with the Blade Runner universe. Yeah, that would be very cool. Different sure. styles of animation and yeah. know, little anthology stories. I would definitely, definitely like that. Yeah, because yeah. the twenty forty nine was. Who'd have thought? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who'd have thought it'd be? Yeah, I, I don't the know. Spinner is sitting at my desk. Oh, I, the, very nice. Yeah, I'm such a junkie for that movie for both those films, for yeah. real. Yeah. I've written so many articles. I can't tell you how many articles I've wrote, written for how many magazines listening to the the two disc version of the score for the original Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. That just was my default go to. I'm in the mountains. The windows open. It's snowing outside. I still have Blade Runner playing as I'm writing or researching, writing, whatever. It's just been this thing throughout my whole yeah. adult, like this whole career is one of the constants is that score. So amazing. Good. So yeah. good. as is tangerine dreams for sorcerer so we're sorcerer. back on track here. right yeah uh <laughs> so i got a quote when researching this time about this movie that i liked from freakin mm-hmm. which uh which he I, he coins it goes with this film but he said like every film is actually three films there's a film there's the film you conceive and plan there's the film you actually shoot and there's the film that emerges with you in the editing room mm. yeah and uh this film though in the editing room after it bombed here was recut for overseas distribution. And what they, they do differently? Some of them shortened up the prologues. Some of them cut it complete, cut them completely, and some inserted them as flashbacks throughout the movie. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it could it change your whole outlook on the film? I'd like to see that. I'd like to see the alternate versions of yeah. it. I wish the Blu-ray here had that on there because yeah. that could, that's another Blade Runner thing. You can look at these different versions and right. it's like, whoa, wait a minute. What? Yeah. Like, huh? And, and, but this could, you could eliminate the beginning and pare it down in a way and it would still be a full length film. Right. If yeah. you cut those into some other thing. I totally get that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. That's what I, mean. I, I love about It's my fascination with editing, which you edit a lot too. You can, yeah. When people are like, well, we found this movie in the editing room. People are like, what are you? It's like, no, you can really, you can really change perspective. You can change, like, mm-hmm. there's so, it's kind of a geeky thing, I guess, but like, you can really change. Like, like I think John Carpenter said, like, he figured out the thing editing. Like, mm-hmm. there was nothing like what he set out to do. And then they went back to shoot more with his mind when he was editing or something. I think I read something like that. You might know you'd. It's wild, man, and 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 you re- and things are revealed to you as you're cutting it. You you find threads because when you're like for me, 
doing documentary and having conversations with people all the time, you're lost in the discussion in that moment. You might not even be cataloging what was just said prior. Mm -hmm. And then if they revisit on some theme later on, it might not even occur to you that it happened. I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting cutting an interview and I realize something important has happened. There's some, there, there's, I'm burying the lead in what I thought this was going to be about. Yeah. And because it ends up being about something very different. And a lot of times there's these really remarkable moments that are in there that you don't catch when you're sitting across the room from someone, but you do when you have a chance to reflect back on this footage and go, oh my God, look at that. Yeah. It's really amazing. Editing is absolutely incredible. And I wish I wasn't always 10 projects deep. Right. Like, you want to appreciate the one. Yeah. I wish I could just eight on your mind. Yeah. Totally. I, I wish I could just sit and just really swim long term, have long deadlines so I can spend an eternity with these things. Because when you put them away, it really is, it's kind of like saying goodbye to something. It's kind of sad right. in a way. And uh, that's, that's the other side of the coin when you work on these things, especially doing this documentary where you're watching the movies over and over to find scenes, to find little moments and dialogue and whatever. Like we, I pour over these movies hundreds of times as I'm cutting these things together. And then frankly, after I work on them, I don't usually watch them very much afterwards. So it is the end of a relationship in some ways for me. It's like the dances that, that we went, we had the build up to it. We went to the dance, we had a great night and then we have to say goodbye. And that's kind of how it feels with some of these things. Yeah. And uh, so it's an interesting relationship with this stuff. Yeah. The productions like theater, like all sorts of things. Like, it's just like a the biggest best family ever for a short time and then it's hey, well, well now we're over yep. and we're never going to see each other because we might not yeah. everyone i i love talking to people about that and that's a question that very rarely ends up in any of these things because i don't think most people care to hear about it but mm -hmm. i'm fascinated by the moment we that you say goodbye to a film because it's such an intense experience where you're in this small like if you're making a movie mm -hmm. you're somewhere usually removed from your normal environment right you're with these people day in and day out you're really just living in a, in a the tiniest city of 100 people 50 30 people however many people are a part of this thing you get used to the faces the personalities the nightlife and whatever and then when you're done the switch is flipped and then you just have to walk away from this family and everyone tells me that they exchange numbers they always say, oh, yeah, we'll stay in touch. I can't wait to next time you come out to L.A., let's get together or whatever it might be. But everyone says it never happens Damn. and they hardly ever see each other again. So it's such a weird thing for actors to have to go through time and again, not only stepping into the flesh of these characters, but also adopting and then abandoning families and over and over and over. Deep relationships, too. Yeah. Like when you do like these things. Like, and it's, it's crazy. You get so deep for such a short time and then just never like you cut off. Like there's, yeah. there's a great moment on like the never sleep again documentary mm -hmm. um, where uh, Mark Patton and um, oh, what's her name? The, the girl from the movie that played his girlfriend. Oh yeah. Oh, what's her name? Uh, but they, are blonde yeah yeah they're switch they're he's coming in for an interview his interview she's leaving and sh they see each other for the first time since that mm -hmm. movie it's like and you can just tell they had because he fled the country like after shortly after elm street too he was just done with hollywood and he disappeared like that mm -hmm. documentary found him mm -hmm. and you just see in their face and they're just their exchange that like they had some sort of deep friendship during that movie and it all came back right then yeah I and mean, it's just they they left it in the left it in the documentary but yeah it's pretty that's cool pretty intense that these things go yeah yeah but um yeah so yeah uh sorcerer i don't know if roy scheider and the other guys had this relationship but uh i'm sure they were knows? exhausted when it was done at I least <laughs> i i know scheider and freakin had a deep appreciation for each other but i don't think they might call each other friends, but it was a tough friendship mm. for the two of them. Um, but Schreider would prove freaking wrong with his, you can't be a league. Cause I mean, he would have like a couple years after this, all that jazz, which is oh, an man. amazing performance. He was up Incredible. for best actor. Yep. Um, unbelievable. Uh, and throughout, throughout the next decade, he'd lead a bunch of movies. He then would go to like lead sequest DSV on mm -hmm. TV, which was a huge moment in television. Like that was a big oh, deal yeah. for that show. Yeah. Um, as much as that didn't 
become like the Star Trek under the sea they wanted it to be. It ran three seasons just like Star Trek, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, it made a mark for sure. But I remember that was a big deal. Roy Scheider is going to be on TV. That was a mm-hmm. big pitch. But yeah, so um, there's that. Uh, th- this, um, this movie was apparently at some point in his life Stephen King's favorite movie. Really? He wrote mm. a thing about his favorite uh, films, and this came in number one at that time. Uh, the, the Exorcist was, I believe, in that too. Um, was that Dance in Dance Maccabi said that? Because I know he has a list of movies he recommends, but I think it's mostly genre stuff in there. Okay. I, I don't know. I just was I was doing it, and I looked up the article that he, uh, I was like, I, mm-hmm. I got to make sure this is not some BS or anything, but it was uh, his number one movie and uh, something he wrote. Uh, oh. some, yeah. He wrote, but I can see that for sure. Um, and then uh, the Mandalorian season two paid homage to this um, in an episode. Uh, really? What they do? Bill Burr. Uh, just kind of a. They had a truck that they were driving through a jungle, had to get somewhere an imperial truck, and they were being attacked. I think it was like a something will blow up if they do something, and a these scavenger guys were attacking the truck as they were trying to get it to safety, and it was very mm. sorcerer esque, and it came came up and i think someone made like a uh a sorcerer uh or a mandalorian poster that looked like the sorcerer poster or something like that that's cool and uh yeah so there's that and lastly fun fact about me i still this day have never watched the wages of fear the original film Um, i haven't uh, seen it either interesting uh, well maybe it's best left like this yeah this is what you need which apparently freaking said i just want the concept i don't want to remake that film which is apparently what he did here so Mm. that's apparently a very different film but i'm so satisfied with this one that yeah leave it be yeah i'm just kind of like well maybe someday wages of fear and i will cross paths but i'll just want to watch sorcerer again yeah yeah well there's some things that are that way sometimes you don't need the whole thing willfully ignorant there with that but yeah yeah Yeah. let it be what it is Uh, the the original miniseries of it I remember that when it came out on DVD, it was a dual sided DVD. Mm-hmm. I think maybe one time I got to the second side. I just didn't even care to see the second half of that story. I was so satisfied with the first. I'm right. cool. I don't need, I don't need the rest. There are some TV series I'm like that with like, no, I'll stop after season two or whatever. Cause I know it, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same power that it does. So I'm a big believer in leaving things be, you don't have to be a completist. There you go. To get it, you know, to, to love it. Watch someone ask me to guest on a podcast to talk about the wages of fear and just destroy me. Someone should. I hope they do. <laughs> so, and then don't watch it intentionally before and just talk about this movie as though this is the same film. See what happens. It was called the wages of fear in some other countries. So maybe I could be like, oh, I watched. Yeah. Oh, I said the wages of fear on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, you should do that. You should or you should challenge someone. Have someone come on. Do that. Find someone who loves that movie. Maybe invite a guest on and say, you have seen that movie. I don't even want to see it. Let's talk about the differences. I think that'd be a really intriguing discussion be. between the two. Of you. Then you don't have to see it. You can they just They haven't of... seen Sorcerer and I haven't seen Wages of Correct. Fear. Yeah. That'd but you can t- speak to the story. That'd be yeah. kind of a fun versus concept in general with remakes and mm-hmm. book adaptations. So you read the book. I saw the film or whatever. That'd be cool. Oh, yeah. That'd be interesting. Have to find yeah. those people. Hope they're good discussionists. Mm, yeah good articulate people would be nice Mm -hmm. um hard to find sometimes but it's a good idea i like that i like that a lot but well thank you for turning me on to this i appreciate it it's something that i was completely unexpected and it was a it was a real joy to to watch it i'm glad it wasn't a waste of your time um it's good but the uh yeah the funny thing is now we're on day four uh nobody that i brought on had seen any of the movies i suggest i i brought to the table which was i like that that's That's cool so yeah yeah, I was like, All right. that, that's fresh takes from people at a different point in their life, mm-hmm. and then that's that's a, that's kind of a neat accident, happy accident, if you think about it, because they're not walking in jaded about something, and in a way, their their fresh perspective lacks the consideration that you've given it over the last few years here. So right. that's cool. And that's I like neat. that they all they've been on they've all people who have been on my show before, and they like know how I am with the movies they bring and they, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's been really, really cool week of conversations here. Nice, man. Awesome. But yeah, Justin, I appreciate you coming on. Always giving me your time. You're a very busy person. If you just check out his work, then you'll see and upcoming stuff. You'll see how busy Justin is. Um, And 
yeah, talking sorcerer, one of my favorites uh, with me. It's been great. Um, yeah. So, and I have, I, I've honestly been dying to talk about this movie somewhere for in all my years of podcasting, I've been done and here it is. So I That's appreciate great. it. I'm honored that you chose me to do it with. Yeah. I appreciate it. Well, That's I appreciate great. you coming on to do it. Um, so uh, before we head out, uh, let people know what you have coming up, where they can keep up with your work and check you out. Uh, let me see. I know that. Um, well, in terms of keeping up with me, I'm on social media. If you look at my name, it's B E A H M. I guess it'll be under the video here, but it's uh, justinbeam.com will keep you up to date on it. You can even subscribe to like an update email thing on there, okay. newsletter thing. So every time a new announcement's up, it'll keep you up. Also on, but on all social media, it's just my name. Like I said, tomorrow's Blades Deadly Friend comes out on October 12th. The Killer Party, October 26th. That ragtime that we discussed is November 16th. Krampus on December 7th. And then I have Harold and Maude, which was just announced today. That's going to be December 7th as well. And this interesting movie called Norway from Shockwaves, which is one of Vinegar's new sub labels. Okay. Brad, it's like Brad Henderson's pet project. He's bringing in all these, these international indie genre films. And I edited this stuff on this movie, Norway, which was just so beautiful. So cool. Uh, right. Just now landing on newsstands, is the October oh, right. issue of Remind Magazine from TV Guide. And they were kind enough to reach out to me earlier this year to ask me to be their guest editor for this October issue. And so I turned the whole thing into it's all about the Halloween franchise and in new interviews with Carpenter, David Gordon Green on Halloween Kills. Um, and I, I mean, the guys from Trick or Treat Studios talking about the history of the masks. Hmm. We have an interview by Anthony Ferrante, who made all the Sharknado films, friend of mine. He did an interview with uh, Tommy Lee Wallace on Halloween 3. We have, I mean, it's just a Ben Scrivens from Fright Rags talking about the history of Halloween collectibles. I like ben. Anyway, he's cool, dude. Oh, he's amazing. But it's just this dense uh, magazine. It's three times the page count as normal. It's available in all Barnes and Nobles. Most, I think, CVS's, Walgreens, Walmart, I think it's going to be in all those. And also at HalloweenRemind.com if you want to order it. It's only six bucks. Huh. And it's really a packed thing that can sit on your nightstand. And my whole concept was to make it feel like the season and mm -hmm. really celebrate these films and give that kind of vintage magazine experience for people again, which I think we, we, we accomplished with it. So that was a tremendous honor to be part of. And that's on stands now. So that's a few awesome. things that are happening. Awesome. Uh, on the Deadly Friend one, is it an urban legend that there's another cut of that movie? Or yeah, is, uh, yeah, it is because the they they decided to well originally it didn't have really any of the violence most any okay. of the violence that ended up in the final movie the basketball scene was added uh, that mm -hmm. that originally ended very differently and Christy Swanson talks to, about that in the interview that I did with her for that she talks about the changes that were made and how hard that was for Wes when they came and they said they issued the edict like well we need to add a bunch of kills like four kills or mm -hmm. something he's like kills what because there's originally a, like a drama yeah it's like a thriller drama kind of a thing and so i everyone that i talked to i asked mm -hmm. about an alternate cut and i mean short of some of the more dramatic elements that were cut out in favor of or, or you know the the new things cut in to replace a lot of the original dramatic elements. I don't think anything longer exists. I even talked to Charles Bernstein, who's the composer mm -hmm. on the picture. And I said, is there a different cut of this film that you scored? He said, no. Gotcha. Yeah, because that's so. the thing that came up when they got announced. And I'm like, well, I, I'm i sure that, like no stone went unturned on that. Like, oh, I we know, try, man. I know yeah. what, you, what you got. Like whenever people are complaining that something's not there, I'm like, it might, it's probably not there. Like it's probably doesn't exist. Like, but it's worth, it's worth checking because yeah. like on um, ragtime, for example, in the inventory didn't show that we had half the stuff that we ended up having oh, wow. yeah. in the, in the, in the vault there on breakdown, finding that alternate opening, everyone said, no, we didn't have it, hmm. but they ended up having it on. I mean, Paramount's the best about this because I have access to the vaults there, of course. But on Last Castle, which is a Robert Redford, James Gandolfini, and Mark Ruffalo picture that came out, suffered a similar fate to this. Although instead of Star Wars, it was 9-11 that crippled this mm -hmm. movie. It's about a, a military prison 
where these prisoners wage their stage a revolt led by a general who was kind of unfairly imprisoned there played by redford and he also directed the film and it the poster for example showed two towers in a prison burning and it was on bill you know on marquees and stuff oh, wow. prior to 9 11 the 9 11 happened so they had to scrap the whole marketing campaign and then they soft pedaled it anyway all that is to point to lead us to there was an alternate ending that was shot originally you see Irwin, his redford's character's military funeral mm-hmm. was what they had planned and they shot it but everyone thought it was too heavy-handed for post 9 11 and so they didn't, oh, they, didn't, okay. they didn't do anything with it so it sat in the vaults and i asked well can we try to f- see if do we have any of that and then mm-hmm. it came back that we had everything that they shot on the day, every oh, shot, okay. every angle, every whatever. And so I had the honor of cutting together and assembling this ending. Oh, wow. And so now it's on that Blu-ray. So it, so this thing, it would have just been in pieces. It would, and it never would have existed had we not asked, yeah. had I not asked about it. And on uh, Bad News Bears, Jackie Earl Haley mentioned that his dad had a Super 8 camera on set for one day. And I'm like, did that, and after we talked, does that footage exist? He ended up, his parents found it, his wife transferred it. So now it's on the Blu-ray. We got the clearance to do it. So anyway, you just never know what's out there. If anyone ever wants to know like Event Horizon, a lot of people wanted the longer cut of Event Horizon. I went to the ends of the earth to try to find that down to having messengers going, picking up videotapes of dailies from people who had some odds and ends, like the writer um everybody involved with that film has been on the hunt for this stuff it's it doesn't exist anywhere it just simply doesn't so i included as much as i could from what has been seen before yeah but w- the number one complaint is always going to be where's that extra footage it's like trust me we are trying yeah like yeah just that's trust what I, me yeah i it's always like where's the why didn't so-and-so interview i'm like i bet they were asked like yeah. it's not like they're not gonna you know like that means they didn't want to do it. It doesn't mean they didn't ask them. Yeah. When I did King Kong 76, which was so packed that it became a two disc. Like we went nuts that on that. That was a good thing. one. I like that one. Yeah. It, everyone's like, why didn't you interview Jeff Bridges? I'm like, well, at the time he was in like, sev- he was in cancer treatment, right. like intensive cancer treatment. And these people are like, oh, I guess you didn't want to participate or didn't even reach out. It's like, you have no idea. Like, we try and we have to, but we have to be compassionate in that kind of situation to this guy is going through something a little bigger than yeah. participating in a commentary or something. You can King probably Kong look 76. up his thoughts on an interview or something. Yeah. You're like, it's, it's yeah. okay. Like, but, but we try. My so favorite is try. you almost got Hanks for, he knows you're alone. That's my favorite. Story. Uh, yeah, I almost did. Yeah. And then he, and he was supposed to, but he was shooting overseas. And then when we were supposed to do it, he, it was the day of the inauguration for biden and it turned and then i turn on the tv and they're like yeah he's not going to be able to do it i'm like god that kind of sucks i was so crestfallen because <laughs> of it but then i turn on the tv that night and there he is introducing biden's speech at the inauguration yeah. thing and i'm like whoa okay i guess you have a good reason for not participating in this but he definitely was game for it oh, yeah. wow so crazy so crazy. yeah and, and paris hilton some things happen that are crazy oh the yeah paris hilton on house of wax was yeah. nuts I mean, I mean, it's just, you, know, you just never know what you're going to get and who's going to say yes. But you always take every shot. I take every shot that I can. We appreciate you for it. And I look forward to more great stuff coming to you. Mm-hmm. Thank from you. you. Like, it's, it's awesome. Thank um, you. All right. Well, uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, not as interesting as Justice. <laughs> okay. Brandon for KUHD. Uh, written work at YSOBlue.com where I review uh, Blu-rays that Justin puts out. Uh, and I'm back again tomorrow. Uh, special guest author Prez Maxson as we close out the week with the Smashing Pumpkins music video for Tonight Tonight but until then stay film positive thank you for listening the Brandon Peters show is a creative zombie studios production produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters written and edited by Brandon Peters Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at brandonpetersshow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at brandonpetersshow.com. 
The show is available on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found.